Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Delphi Economic Forum's uh, panel on European enlargement. European enlargement was, is, and will be one of the major topics in the discussion, both in the EU but also in the countries that are aiming and are aspiring to enter the EU. And uh, with us, we have two uh, people who know the issue in their hearts, who know the issue and have very uh, personal and deep experience regarding European enlargement and the challenge thereof. So I would like to welcome to today's panel His, Ex His Excellency uh, George Chiamba, the Ambassador of Romania to the Hellenic Republic, and also His Excellency Radislav Kacer, the Ambassador of the Slo uh, Slovak Republic in the Czech Republic. Uh, welcome and hopefully we'll have the next 20 minutes at our disposal for a very interesting uh, conversation. So right off the bat, I would like to ask you a, more, a rather provocative question. The, 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 uh, the topic of the panel is go deep uh, or go broad, but I would like to ask you, given our current situation, given the pandemic and given the challenges we're facing in the EU and globally, uh, and the consequences we have to deal with both now and also in the future, how timely is the discussion of, an, of uh, European enlargement? Is there an actual reason to talk about enlargement right now, or should we focus on more pressing issues at hand? So, Mr. Chamba, I would like to have your uh, insights on this, and then I will move on to, Ms., uh, to Ambassador Hatcher. Thank you so much. You know, first of all, you should recognize that when we speak about strategic autonomy, we speak about Europe being a global power. We should speak, first of all, what we can do in our region. And I think enlargement has been such a successful type of policy, uh, stabilizing the areas around the, around the uh, stabilizing the areas in Europe. And I think, you know, both Romania and Slovakia is the child of enlargement, are a proof what enlargement has brought to us. And I think this is our duty to bring it to the others. And I don't think how we can be really, how we can matter on a global scene, how on, uh, on, at the global level, if we are not going to be able to deliver on what we promised. And I think we have a couple of commitments that we have not been able to deliver, and we are looking forward to do so in the next, in the next months. Ambassador uh, Kacher? <clears throat> Absolutely, it's timely debate, because uh, when we will look at where, where we are today, uh, it was May uh, when we got the first time debate on Western Balkans in Foreign Affairs Council in two years. And I think uh, it's not a, a very good sign. We should pay much more attention and uh, it's a false question, go, go wider or deeper, because this can work hand in hand. Uh, we don't have to uh, say, is this of two alternatives? And this region has been extremely important to us, uh, to whole Europe, and precisely as Ambassador mentioned and stressed, the previous enlargement was a true, true success story. We should be proud of that. And I learned that in this very building was signed the accession uh, of, uh, of Slovakia, which is something. And when we look back at the years, uh, it's a success story and we need to look at the Western Balkans with this perspective. So you believe that the pandemic is not, uh, is, is an opportunity rather than a, a factor that will uh, move us away from enlargement, right? No, what I believe frankly is that we have to prove because of pandemics you have to be better in cohesion. And I think mm. in, because of pandemic, cohesion in Europe suffered. And I think it's, it's high time now and this is what the efforts are we are all doing and together with the Commission to prove that at the end the cohesion in Europe is important. And then of course it's come the co co cohesion with the candidate countries and as well to prove to them that you know, Europe is not only a choice of you know, economics, whatever, it's a choice of values. And I think this is important in these times when you know you have different type of values that are not the right ones, so to say, which are coming in from out of Europe, trying to, trying, to over, trying to get over in some of the countries that are in this type of gray area. I think we cannot afford. And on the other hand, we have to look on the map. You know, it's very clear. The Western Balkans are in Europe. Sure, you know, pandemic created a you know, whole uh, plethora of problems, uh, not only for Europe, but for, for whole the world, globally, absolutely. So we will have to deal with economic consequences and a number of others. But, 
um, it reminds us uh, that uh, Europe should be working much closer because uh, with the challenges like pandemics, before challenges migra migration, this, we, this needs stronger Europe, more cooperative Europe. So on the top of the global competition, which was mentioned already by uh, Ambassador Chamba, you know, the issues of pandemics shown us on, on the contrary, you know, that we need to go uh, deeper in Europe and Europe needs closer cooperation to face challenges like this in the future more efficiently. What about the candidate countries and what about the solidarity that Europe has or has not shown uh, towards them? And I'm discussing about uh, medical and health solidarity in terms of vaccination, but also about fiscal solidarity due to the challenges these countries are facing and will be facing because of the pandemic. Do you think that the uh, EU has stepped up, has stepped up to its uh, purpose? And if mm. yes and if no, what are the consequences that we might face given uh, the EU stance on the in terms of solidarity? You know, at the beginning, we have to fully recognize, even between the member states, we had a number of issues. And when it came to vaccination, I think that the couple of weeks have been what, what we have taken stock of is a renewed effort by the member states, by the commission. And this goes as well to the candidate countries. I think we have seen a lot more generosity. I think we have seen a lot of more uh, vaccines being sent to, to all the, these countries than before. But in a way, you know, this goes in hand in hand, in hand with you know, what we are doing in Europe. I think the last, of course, it, the vaccination process didn't start so well for Europe, we have to recognize it, but we should say that we are on track. And we should say that there is clearly a better, a better outcome and it's in the same time, I think we have a better expectations of what we can do in a couple of months only than what we had one month. And I think it goes for the others. I think we are ready now, I think it's a more help every day. You can see a commissioner, you can see member states sending vaccines to many other countries. You know, Romania is, doing his best to help and assist Republic of Moldova, for example, with vaccines. So I think Greece is doing, would be doing more for Northern Macedonia. Uh, in the same time, I think uh, the Commission is doing more for all these countries. So, and as I said, it's the same thing that it happens in our countries. The vaccination campaign is doing a lot better. I think these days, in some member states and even in the big member states, than it was one month and a half ago. You know, the problem was at the beginning of pandemics that um, among European competencies, uh, the healthcare, uh, it's not something which would be the, 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 the shared responsibility. So there was very much competition, very much competence uh, from Brussels, uh, from the Commission. But we have to look back because in the, in the previous years, uh, Europe as the European Union was very strongly present in terms of assistance and solidarity. Uh, within the uh, investment programs and money transfers, uh, there was a lot of lot of help uh, actually coming from Europe to Western Balkans. And if, even if you would look into, uh, I was checking these numbers uh, on my page, if you would look into the direct investment in the region, whole, if you would look a uh, whole bulk of the investment in Western Balkans, 72% comes uh, from European Union states. Only 4.6% comes from Russia and only less than 1% comes from China. Today, probably when you would look, when you would do the scanning of public opinion views, I think this will be neglected and people will think otherwise. So probably this is not only a question of money, but we need to work the soft things, the emotions. I wanted to uh, step up on this one, on your last comment and ask you, given your experience and your knowledge of the Western Balkans, how do these countries and the people in this country perceive the European uh, solidarity. You mentioned you gave us figures, but what about the public sentiment? Do you believe that the people, the, the uh, public opinion in these countries is pro-Europe uh, in terms of uh, solidarity? Mm. Clearly from the very beginning they are pro-Europe because, you know, actually enlargement is about the soft power of Europe and, in the, and about the hard power of Europe. It's in the same time. Because, you know, if you have, so to say, uh, not so friendly actors going on in these countries that we are going to pay a price for. Mm. But these, these people are going for Europe because they are going for the values of Europe and they are ready to do sacrifices. You shouldn't forget that in some of these countries you had quite, like we had in our countries too, quite a process of reforms, uh, you know, that in a way put the pressure on the society. Mm. Uh, 
of course, you, you, you had, of course, the other example. What means the power of Europe? You know, the only positive, so to say, outcome, you know, for Europe in the, quite a number of years were the press peace agreements. We have to recognize this shows how strong the power of Europe was for, for Northern Macedonia, how strong Europe itself as a concept is. Uh, so uh, this is from where they started. What is going to happen now because of the pandemics? We have to take a look, I think, later on. I don't see, I don't, I don't have, so to say, data to say that this is going to turn against mm. un the union, the people, because they are not vacci vaccinations. Of course, you know, frankly speaking, the vaccination campaign is going to give as well a sort of map of, so to say, of how advanced the society is, how modernized, how modern, and how modernized the societies are. Because, you know, we are going to look into the numbers of people willing to take vaccinations, the ones that are not willing to, and of course, the others, they don't care. You know, they just you have to go after them. And I think this is going to give you a, a glimpse of how the society actually is prepared for European values and how modern it became. So I think, you know, it's too, too, too soon to say. But on the other hand, I think if we step in now accordingly, I think we, have, we can repair and fix. Mm. If something was broken, if now we, we really come with the kind of support they need, I think we can, we can fix it. I'm a little more worried on this, uh, frankly, because I see erosion in this area here, and we've been measuring this uh, from Globsec uh, about the mood, and mood is becoming more reserved, uh, less, uh, less enthusiastic. Uh, and um, I would subscribe this to, to a number of elements, but uh, one of that is, of course, that we don't see that the light at the end of the tunnel is approaching too much, because when we will look at the reality, not too many new chapters were um, started or closed uh, with the countries who started the association process. There was um, not a great movement, uh, so train was not moving ahead too much. And also, you know, all of that EU debate is becoming a little dry, a little bureaucratic. It's got a little, little emotions in there. And what used to be, as Ambassador was stressing, the soft power of Europe, Europe leading by example, by, by the sexiness of its model, of living, that's been through some erosions as well. And it started with probably with migration crisis when we, saw, when we saw some examples of erosion of solidarity. You know, you here in Greece, you know what, what I'm talking about. You, you yourself needed to see now more of a sign of solidarity from others. And here I would be self-critical for countries of, of Central Europe. It changed with my new government. Um, but I, I think we see a, a little bit of, of, of fatigue uh, here and I think we, we need to do something about it. We need, to, we need to bring more positive emotions in this, and we need to see the train moving, and we need to see chapters starting and rolling. Another major issue in the Western Balkans is stability, and stability in the face of escalating foreign interference, and we see that. We, see, we, we keep seeing that in the last few months, might say, an escalation in foreign interference. So what should the EU do in order to achieve the stability? What are the actions that EU must take in order to move towards this direction and lead by an example? It's very easy, I think. We should move on with the process. If you want to achieve, we have to deliver. But, you know, in a way, of course, the headwinds are different. This is right. You have elections processes in Europe. You, you, you have a Europe that has a fatigue of enlargement. Yes. We should not forget that President Juncker mentioned a very, so, so to say, out of, there was no date. He put something like 2027, but with no guarantees. We should not forget that our countries had a different approach. We had dates when we should finalize. So, of course, these, these are the realities of the place. And then, of course, you start to have an infusion of, so to say, using enlargement as a tool for domestic politics that I should not encourage in some countries. You know, you just block and you don't block, or you know, and it, you can get votes or you can lose votes. But what we have to do, it's easy. We, we should do more, because if we don't do, sooner or later, the price of not doing could be higher yeah. than what we think today. And as, because there is clearly interference, there are a lot of actors going. I think Greece knows better about it because it was not so easy to, to, 
to do the press pass, to keep the press pass agreements in place, and to have this kind of positive atmosphere keeping on in Northern Macedonia, because there are many that are unhappy about solving issues. There are many countries they don't like when issues are solved. They like to keep them on, <laughs> because this is the source of their strength. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would just catch on this last point, because uh, it's a headwind coming in, in, in many directions, from many directions. Uh, what we should do from Europe is, of course, go by our own example. So Europe should be consolidated, working together and show solidarity from within and go successfully in, in other areas of deepening where we already started. And there is a couple of areas we started uh, the integration, but we stopped in the middle of the way. Even on the single market, it's not that single as we intended to be. Uh, European Monetary Union, uh, it's unfinished business yet. Uh, uh, Schengen is not finished business. So if we want to use the soft power, we need to show that Europe is evolving in the right way, in a good direction. So we need to be efficient from within. Second thing what we should do is to involve every actor in Balkans uh, to, to work the, the soft image or, and, and the soft power of the European Union. So it's, it's not only that, that you support, that you give money, that you invest and you do a lot, but it's not that seen, it's not that appreciated. So we need to get involved in a closer dialogue with media, with the civic society, with NGOs, with politicians, etc., etc. So there is a trust that this is a real thing. And of course, we should not underestimate the other headwinds, because when we were in a, a going for the enlargement, at the time, Russia was not against the EU enlargement. They were saying, well, we hate that NATO enlargement, but that will go ahead with EU. It, now, it's not the case. Now. Uh, Russia is, uh, is a strategic challenger here on the uh, European front, and it's actively working against uh, the mood of enlargement here in Western Balkans. And we see the results of Infowar going on here. So and we have to face it. We have to, first of all, understand what's going on and, and have to face it. And given the fact that we're having this discussion at the Delft Economic Forum in Athens, I would like to ask you what the role of Greece in this situation is or should be, and what can be achieved through bilateral or even trilateral endeavors in order to act as an example, as you mentioned, for the soft power of Europe towards the, uh, the uh, countries in the Western Balkans? No, you know, Greece, first of all, the major plus it was all the time a champion of the enlargement because everything started with the Thessaloniki agenda. On the other hand, once you have done the press agreement, Greece and Romania, in a way, are very similar in the sense that you don't have a negative agenda. Mm. It's, you know, the problem in the Balkans, you know, is the zero-sum game. Everybody has a negative <laughs> agenda. You know, we don't have it. I think Greece doesn't have it. And I think this is a major advantage that it has to take on. Plus, I think both of us have a state strategic interest because we have between us and the core of Europe this gray area even from a single market point of view. The trucks and the goods cannot go straight to the center of Europe because they have to go through customs. Mm. I think this, this would help all of us but once this area is becoming part of the Union. And secondly, I think if we don't do it now, we are going to do it later. Because we are going to pay the price later mm. because you have a lot of actors there. Plus, I think both for the Union, for Greece, for Romania, this is a place to, so to say, express a renewed transatlantic link mm -hmm. because there is a clear interest, not only from the Union. And I think the process of enlargement, we have to recognize it, has not been only something driven by, by Europe. In this part of the world, has been driven sometimes by the United States. And I think the, the American policy in the area has been all the time to favor these countries getting in the, in the European Union. No. And I think this is where we can, we can work yes. together. And I think this is where we yes. can get together. Yes, that's a good point. I, I absolutely agree. The last point was important because now we see fortunately different American foreign policy approach uh, and its renewed commitment uh, to issues of Central Europe and, and whole Europe cooperation. I think uh, it was not here uh, for four years. So uh, that's a good thing. Um, Greece, uh, first of all, congratulations on your bicentennial. Uh, Greece has strong democratic uh, credentials and traditions here. It's a key player uh, in southeastern Europe. And in the whole southern flank, it's a key player. So your role is essential because you're involved in, in, in you, you physically here 
and you depend on the stability of Western Balkans, probably like nobody else. Here uh, we are in, in this triangle, all the states, uh, who's got stakes here, uh, is Romania, is Slovakia, whole Central Europe. Um, oh, we, we want, because this is proximity, it's historical ties, it's a transit route, uh, we want Balkans stable, and we saw what a kind of uh, disturbance uh, this can bore if, if Balkan was uh, not stable. We saw it historically a number of times. We are too close. So um, Greece can play absolutely essential role, uh, first of all, in helping the states uh, uh, with a positive agenda, but also pushing all the bulk of the issues of integration of Western Balkans through your credibility, through your experience, through all the credentials you got. I absolutely think uh, the role. And here, I'm, I have to be an unbiased because I like very much Delphi Economic Forum, even for a like this pushing agenda, bringing together decision makers, media, uh, policy makers, think tankers, uh, and, and all people who, who are active in the foreign policy and security issues. That's steering, you know, that's helping, that's raising the agenda. I think even the, 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 the Delphi Forum is doing substantial work on that. So in order to conclude our, conclude our very interesting discussion, I have kept a number of points that are, I believe are the most important ones. First is, that the timing is of the essence, that even if we're facing challenges, now is the time to show solidarity and to actually uh, do it in practice and lead by example. The Western Balkans do need European solidarity, especially in regards to the pandemic, and we need to, to, uh, to do a positive show of force, a uh, uh, show of our soft power towards uh, the people in the, Balkan, uh, in the Western Balkan countries in order uh, to achieve and to overcome the challenges these countries are facing and, the, and to overcome the influence from uh, external uh, factors. And, and another major issue that you raised is that we need to accelerate uh, the, the, the process, the, the enlargement process to close chapters, to actually do things that are, have a practical and important significance towards us and our countries can play a major role since we are all in the neighborhood and can uh, uh, deliver what's needed for the enlargement to take part both on a broader but also on a deeper perspective. And with this note, I would like to thank you both of you uh, for our very interesting and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you for, thank for you. the moderation. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so much and thank you for the organizers. And very successful as usual. Yeah, good job done. Uh, very successful. Yes. Thank you it's the much. first, Delphi I think is the first semi-real event we can see in the last couple of months. Absolutely good job.